Good afternoon and welcome to a webinar on qualifying dietary supplement suppliers in the era of COVID-19 hosted by EAS Consulting Group and presented by Senior Director for Dietary Supplements and Tobacco Services, Dr. Tara Lynn Couch. EAS, a member of the Certified Family of Companies, is a global leader in regulatory solutions for industries regulated by FDA, USDA, and other federal and state agencies. Our network of over 150 independent advisors and consultants enables EAS to provide comprehensive consulting, training, and auditing services, ensuring proactive regulatory compliance. Today's presenter is Dr. Tara Couch. Dr. Couch is a PhD analytical organic chemist with exceptional analytical ability, abilities, excuse me, and over 25 years of diverse laboratory and regulatory experience. She is a sought after expert on issues pertaining to quality control, including the establishment of specifications and the development of well-organized, sophisticated laboratories, and has assisted numerous companies with the development, improvement, and implementation of strong quality systems that are scientifically sound, efficient, practical, and compliant with all FDA regulations. Tara serves on a variety of industry committees for the Council for Responsible Nutrition, Consumer Healthcare Products Association, and Food Drug Law Institute, and she is also active in the American Herbal Products Association. As a reminder, during the webinar, you may ask any questions for Tara by typing them into the chat box or the questions box. And with that, I will... Thank you, Amy. I think I say this every time I always sound old when you say all that. Uh, all right, well, welcome to um, our webinar today about supplier qualification in the era of COVID-19. So I'll start with a little bit of introduction. Um, most of you are well aware of this, but the FDA um, was established in 1908, um, which prohibited interstate commerce of adulterated and misbranded foods and drugs. Um, and then in 1938, we've got the FDNC Act, which is the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which allowed enforcement by the FDA, no private enforcement, but was the first, first uniform federal standard for the safety of foods, drugs, and cosmetics. There have been numerous uh, amendments to the act since 1938. The two that we're going to be talking about today that are most and that are relevant to us is in 1994, we had the Dietary Sup Supplement Health and Education Act known as DSHEA or DSHEA, which created a legal class of dietary supplements and allowed for structure function claims. Uh, more recently in 2011, we had this Food Safety Modernization Act um, or FISMA. The Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act or DSHEA of 1994, as I said, created a legal class of dietary supplements legal class of foods called dietary supplements. So there was sort of a, a historical definition of dietary supplements, and this was broadened um, and obviously formalized. It also allowed, it, allowed for structure function claims and some specific health claims for dietary supplements and authorized FDA to promulgate good manufacturing practices. This was done 14 years later um, in 21 CFR 111, which is a code of federal regulations, which are current good manufacturing practice in manufacturing, packaging, labeling, or holding operations for dietary supplements. For dietary supplements as well. So this is the definition of a dietary supplement. Uh, so the dietary supplement is a product that is taken by mouth. It has to be ingested and includes dietary ingredients that are vitamins, minerals, herbs, or other botanicals, amino acids, uh, enzymes, organic tissues, glandulars, or metabolites, um, or extracts or contracts, concentrates of any of the any of those. So, different forms of dietary supplements include tablets, capsules, soft gels, gel caps, liquids, and powders. Um, but they must uh, be dem demonstrated to not be a sole item of a meal or a diet; otherwise, it would be classified as solely a food. In these good manufacturing practices in 21 CFR 111, these are issued and enforced by the FDA to control and supervise the companies that do this, these manufacturing and packaging operations. This requires the development and implementation of a quality system 
And this is an approach to ensure that you minimize or ideally eliminate instances of contamination, mis mix ups, and errors, which in turn protects the public from purchasing a product that's not effective or certainly not uh, dangerous. There are a number of different CFRs um, that have been issued for all of the FDA uh, regulated industries, dietary supplements being one of them. Um, cosmetics, um, ironically, we've never seen uh, an actual CFR be issued, but we do have a guidance back from 2013. And tobacco has been, uh, the FDA has been, been demonstrated to uh, promulgate tobacco regulations since 2009, but we haven't yet seen those. So those are supposedly coming soon. So this is 21 CFR Part 111 in the pocket guide that the FDA uh, issues. It states that you must establish component specifications that address the identity, purity, strength, composition, and limited limits of contaminants for those components. There is no definition of specifications in the regulations. However, the ICH, which is the International Conference on Harmonization, does have a definition of specifications, which is a defined list of tests, reference to those procedures, and appropriate acceptance criteria, which are numerical limits or ranges, usually with a maximum and a minimum, or other test criteria that are described. So just using that definition, this is what a generic specification would look like. You have for a component, uh, you'd have the categories of identity, purity, strength, composition, and contaminants. You have the test parameter. You have what that specification or acceptance criteria range is and the spe specific test method that's going to be used to conduct that testing. So in 21 CFR 111.75, before you use any components, you must conduct the testing to verify that that specification has been met. So you have to conduct at least one appropriate test or examination to verify the identity of the ingredient. Remember, that was one of our categories. Um, and you can confirm that identity, identity um, by either conducting the test or potentially relying on the certi certificate analysis or C of A that comes from the supplier. However, if you're going to rely on the certificate and analysis that comes from the supplier, you have to first qualify the supplier. So that brings us to the supplier qualification. So it elaborates a little bit more in the regulation in 111.75 A2II, and there's subparts A through E of that. Um, and what it dictates is that the supplier qualification requirement of that C of A that you're receiving from the, the supplier by some sort of confirmation tests um, or examinations and comparing those to that C of A. That C of A must also have certain criteria on it that basically meet the definition of a specification with also the results that are there. So that's in a description of the test, that acceptance criteria the actual results obtained, and the identity of the test method that was used to perform that testing. Then you also must gather and maintain other documentation of the qualification activities that you might do. And then periodically, you have to reconfirm the supplier C of A and, and do a requalification. And then the quality unit, which is collectively quality assurance and quality control, must review and approve this documentation, setting forth the, setting forth the basis for this qualification and all subsequent requalifications. So this is the regulatory requirement of a supplier qualification. So for the qualification status, there are usually three, three criteria that are, are used. So a qualified supplier is one that has been deemed acceptable uh, to provide the raw materials to, um, to the manufacturer or the old label distributor. Um, and this is based on, based on a variety of different things, a supplier qualification questionnaire, a risk assessment, an on-site audit, and other confirmation testing results. There's also provisionally qualified status of a supplier. This is a supplier that's deemed temporarily acceptable. Uh, to provide raw materials, um, and that may be because there are some corrective and preventive actions that have to be put in place um, during, the t during the time that you'd be temporarily using them, but there were no critical observations um, depending on those uh, evaluations, or a supplier could be not qualified, so that would be that they'd be unacceptable to do this work. 
So a basic supplier qualification program then is a multi-step risk-based process and includes at least four, four categories. So that is a supplier documentation audit, that confirmation testing, an on-site audit, and then periodic requalification of that supplier. So we're gonna dig into what all of those mean. So the documentation audit is often referred to as a paper audit. This is the first step of your supplier qualification program. Um, so what this does is examines the, the CGMP quality system at the supplier um, along with all key personnel qualifications. A regulatory assessment of the supplier should also be done and this can easily be evaluated on the FDA website. This is conducted by providing the supplier with what's referred to as a supplier qualification questionnaire. This is a lengthy document that's completed by the supplier quality unit, again, collectively the QA, QC. Um, and this will also be supported by documents. So just like with an FDA, um, just because you say it doesn't mean anything, it has to be documented or it didn't happen. So there'll have to be some SOPs that would be provided, other documents or records that would be provided to support the responses to this qualification questionnaire. Once those are completed, the quality unit will be reviewing that questionnaire. All of those responses must be thorough and detailed, and that will help you do an initial risk assessment of the supplier. So anything that would be incomplete, or obviously if they didn't return the questionnaire to you, you would immediately disqualify or not qualify that supplier. If, the if they do respond, but they're unsatisfactory, i.e. they don't have a quality system or people aren't appropriate quality, appropriately qualified, they don't have the facilities you need, then they would also be ranked as not qualified. The next step is the confirmation testing. So sometimes this is happening sort of simultaneously um, as the questionnaire is being uh, completed, uh, but you wanna make sure that you use your resources appropriately and don't waste your time and money. So, so before you start doing a bunch of testing, you wanna at least get a preliminary assessment of the supplier. Um, so this confirmation testing is testing in accordance to your raw material specification that we just spoke about that's dictated in 111.70b um, and making sure that the C of A includes all of that information um, and you test and compare those results. So again, that supplier C of A has to have the description of the test, the acceptance criteria, and the identification of the test method used. You wanna make sure that you're comparing apples to apples um, when, you're, when you're doing this confirmation testing. And then they'll have the actual results obtained on the supplier C of A. When you do the confirmation testing, you'll compare your results and make sure that within the method variability, the results are consistent. <clears throat> This is conducted for every single raw material. So even though the questionnaire is only going out to the, to the supplier and they may be providing many raw materials for you, this confirmation test is done for every single raw material that you're going to be using from that particular supplier. This is typically performed on the first three or up to potentially the first five unique uh, material lots received. Uh, the FDA likes the rule of three because that then you technically get a mean and standard deviation. And so that's sort of the rule of three that applies. But sometimes given the nature of the raw materials, if you're talking about a botanical or maybe a mineral that is um, that may have uh, potential contamination from heavy metals, lead for example, um, it may be better to have a little bit more data and more assessment of uh, things are grown in different seasons and you'd want to collect samples across different seasons and across different harvests. The next step would be an on-site audit. So you would only delve into this once you are satisfied with obviously your documentation audit as well as the confirmation testing and all of that has demonstrated that you have some confidence in what's going on at the supplier. So then you'd go on site and do a facility audit. Now this is done based on a risk assessment. So certainly all high risk suppliers would be people that you would absolutely want to go out and do an on-site audit. An on-site audit is really truly the only way that you can accurately assess um, an, a company's systems, policies, and processes and making sure that they're appropriately followed. So you would hire an auditor if you don't already have an auditor that has the uh, education training experience in-house. 
to go in and do that for you. So you'll evaluate that CGMP compliance for a dietary supplement ingredient supplier if they are not making finished dietary supplement products. The regulation applies to them is underneath the Food Safety Modernization Act of 2011, and the GMP there is 21 CFR 117, as opposed to the dietary supplement GMPs, which are 21 CFR 111. Most of your dietary ingredient suppliers are going to comply with 21 CFR 117 because those regulations are generally easier in the CGMPs than they are for 111. 111 is a much more pharmaceutical-like um, regulation, but there are some suppliers that opt to follow uh, 111 because that might be their um, client base and they've done that for business purposes. So whatever the regulation that they've dictated that they're going to be following, that would be what you would be uh, assessing compliance for. You would want to make sure that all the people that are in place at the um, supplier have the technical expertise that's necessary to comply with these regulations and make the raw material that you're asking them to make for you and supply for you. That means that also the facility has to be appropriate and they need to have the appropriate equipment that's been qualified, calibrated, um, used and maintained properly. The services that they provided, de depending on what you need from your raw material supplier, how often and the volume of material that you might be getting from them, they need to obviously be able to deliver. Quality systems are also critical, so to ensure that they have data integrity, remember the whole purpose of doing this is to be able to rely on their su supplier C of A, so they have to be able to have those systems to generate that data and make sure that that, um, that is accurate, precise, and specific for the ingredients, and you have the appropriate material quality when you receive that material. After the audit has been conducted, then an audit report will be provided, um, identifying and raking the various observations of these issues, um, and that would be used to then reevaluate your risk assessment of that supplier. Then periodically, you have to requalify the supplier. So what that typically means is that annually, um, you'll send the supplier qualification questionnaire back to the supplier and have them provide any updates. Again, this is a lengthy document and they'll be irritated if you ask them to fill this out every single year. But if you provide it to them again and say, please provide us with any changes or updates, that would be something you'd want to know. So um, if they had like the best thing about the whole facility is that they had um, a specific person in quality that um, was really on top of things and that person is no longer there, or maybe they have an entirely new facility, those are things that you'd want to know that will help you make decisions of whether to go through some other exercises to requalify them or go through and find a different uh, supplier. You also want to do some additional confirmatory testing, so sort of basically spot checking on what's going on with the C of A's that you are receiving. Uh, so that should be performed. Uh, the rule of thumb is every 10th lot or annually, whichever comes first. So that corresponds to at least 10% of the receipts that you would be getting. Um, and then at that point, you would do full testing in accordance to your raw material specification, comparing that to the supplier's C of A. Now, it's worth noting here that just because um, the supplier may have a lot of other things on their specification that you may not be concerned about depending on how you may use that material, that's perfectly fine. If it's the other way and you have more specifications than the supplier does, you can still potentially use, um, do a, a supplier qualification for the items that they do have, but you obviously won't be able to rely on the C of A if there's no test results reported on that. So you would not be able to reduce, uh, not do any testing on a particular thing on your raw material specification if there's no result from your supplier. Then there may be the requirement also for follow-up on-site audits. The frequency of this will depend on the supplier risk assessment that's conducted. So, and even based on the annual update you get from the documentation audit in the scenario I just used, if that particular uh, quality person is no longer there, that may warrant you going back on site and evaluating who they do have. Or if they have a new facility, obviously then you would wanna go back on site and evaluate the raw material supplier. 
So I've mentioned uh, risk assessment a couple of times. So um, for the supplier qualification, this is a multi-step risk assessment based system. So just to make it simple, suppliers can assign, will be assigned a high, medium, or low risk. Some people will give scores to suppliers and make this in a very elaborate system, with it, which is perfectly fine, but you need to have some sort of system of, of assigning this risk. Uh, the first assignment is done after the receipt of that supplier qualification questionnaire, which is the documentation audit that you'll, doing, that you'll do. Thereafter, that initial assessment can be changed uh, depending on the outcome of the CFA confirmation testing, the on-site audit that you, that you would do, um, and material receipts. If you're receiving materials frequently that are having OOS results, or um, you're having challenges with getting the material, challenges with communicating with the supplier, delivery times, you know, that may change your assessment of the risk of that particular supplier. Some factors to consider when you're looking at the risk is the country of origin of the material. Um, that can be important because of the different contaminants that might be present. Um, and now as we're gonna talk later about COVID-19, where the material might be coming from could also be a potential issue. Um, also, the, the uh, regulatory requirements are different in different countries. There are many countries that use um, certain types of chemicals now that have been banned in the U.S. since 1974. So um, you need to make sure you, that that's something to consider. Uh, the supplier's regulatory history, the manufacturing expertise at the, at, the, uh, at the supplier, and the process complexity both for the raw material and on your end when you're manufacturing and formulating the dietary supplement product. The results of um, all those supplier qualification activities, including the documentation audit, the C of A confirmation testing, the on-site audit, your material specifications, so how those compare with the raw material suppliers, the complexity of the material, the possibility of uh, and potential for contamination. So I sort of alluded to a lead contamination. Botanicals often contain uh, microbial loads, and that might also be something that you want to consider when, as a risk assessment that will always carry uh, some micro content, for example. The criticality of the ingredient for your business and for your formulations, the volume of use, um, if there's a compendial status, this is supposed to be a USP grade type of material, that might be something that to take into consideration. And any potentially known economic, economic adulteration potential. So underneath the Food Safety Modernization Act, there is the intentional adulteration rule or the IA rule. Um, that also falls underneath 21 CFR 111, uh, 70 requirements for potential contaminants. So that would be something you have to look for. Melamine is a perfect example of that. When we have melamine um, being used to, to mimic uh, protein content in uh, lots of different um, uh, products with uh, high, amino acid con high amino content. Also historical supplier interactions, as I mentioned, um, how things have been going with the communications and the receipts of the materials any deviations out of specifications or non-conformance that have occurred um, as a result of these materials that you're receiving from the supplier. So this is something that you'll sort of continually loop through and, and revise your risk assessment as necessary. Again, in a GMP world, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So you have to prepare some sort of supplier qualification dossier or folder that organizes all of the documentation uh, activities that are all of the activities that have been done for the supplier qualification. So that will include a record of all of the qualification activities. So your, your documentation on it, your confirmation testing, whether it was three or five, how many recalls you've done confirmation testing associated with those, updated dossiers you've done for those, on-site audits, um, and any records of any issues that you may have. So if you had a nonconformance on a product that you were able to trace back to a raw material, I would put documentation of that, um, that deviation or nonconformance, I would put it in the file with this particular raw material. Uh, statement of the qualification status, and that often is statements because you will start with one and, and that can change to different levels, um, both 
in a good way and a bad way, uh, depending on the situation. And then all of this has to be reviewed and approved by the quality unit and then obviously maintained in a file that can be shown to the FDA when they come to evaluate your supplier qualification program. This is a regulatory requirement. The whole benefit of doing the supplier qualification program is to be able to rely on their, that certificate of analysis and go to a reduced testing schedule. So this is not a skip lot testing schedule, it's a reduced testing schedule because you still will always have to do identification testing for every receipt of every material that you get. Right. So the reduced testing schedule would apply to strength, purity, composition, and contaminant testing if the data supports that and you have that data on the certificate of analysis from your supplier that you've already confirmed and that supplier is qualified or at least provisionally qualified. There are some uh, guidance documents that are available on supplier qualification. Uh, I've listed a few of them here. So the FDA has a guidance for industry for uh, drug um, qualification, drug uh, uh, security. This does have some information about a SNE, which is a standard numerical identification number that does not apply to dietary supplements, but the, pre the um, the rest of the premise of this regulation uh, is actually very applicable. Um, USP Chapter 1083, which is Distribution Practices and Supply Chain Integrity, is based on that guidance um, without the SME information in there, so that also can be very valuable. And then the CD Working Group, uh, which is a coalition of a variety of trade organizations, um, they also put out a guidance document in 2013, and I actually think that that's been updated since um, that is also a good uh, tool for that. And the ICH has, um, uh, Q9 has quality risk management guideline that was put out in 2005, can help you assess how to rank these and change risk assessment parameters. So the FSVP um, is a foreign supplier verification program. This is the rule that comes out of the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA. So remember, this was one of the other amendments to the FD&C Act that I mentioned previously. Since dietary supplements are a classification of foods, FISMA does apply to us. Now, because we are compliant with 21 CFR 111, most of what it, uh, um, is required is already covered, and we are actually exempt from some of the sections of FISMA in the first place. Um, but the FSVP is not one of those, so that is not covered underneath 21 CFR 111. So the FSP rule that applies, though, is modified, and it varies depending on the types of materials and products that are being imported, who's responsible for that importation, and who's the importer of record, which is an official um, classification. And then, so all of these things have to be known in order to assess what FSVP requirements are applicable to you as a dietary supplement manufacturer or not. Um, so they do apply, and what you want to do is rope these situate rope these requirements into the supplier qualification program that we just discussed in order to meet 21 CFR 11175 A2. So the FSVP rule, again, depends on the type of importer that you are. So if you're the direct port importer, you import it yourself, um, and you are compliant with 21 CFR 111, which are the dietary supplement GMPs, then you will have the specification that we discussed in 11170, and you'll be testing in accordance to that specification in accordance to 11175. If that's the case, then you do not have to meet the entirety of the FSVP rule, what you have to do is have a qualified individual, and you have to be identify the direct importer as the importer of record. So since this is me, I'd have to identify myself as the importer of record, and that's all that, that I must do. So you would just have to have that QI, or qualified individual, and have that record state that you're the importer. If um, you're the customer, um, of the importer of record, importers whose customers are subject to dietary supplement GMPs, but who also 
are subject to 21 CFR 111, again, having a specification and testing to that specification. Also, you do not have to meet the entirety of the FSBP rule, but the requirements are a little bit, a little bit, um, strength, little bit strengthened because you're not, you are not the importer of record yourself. You do have to have the qualified individual. You have to identify the direct importer as the import of record, so that'll be your customer. Um, and then you must annually obtain some sort of written assurance from your customer that states that they are in compliance with the FSVP rule, and then they have to follow the standard record keeping requirements as do you. So these are also, also already dictated in subpart P of 21 CFR 111 for records retention, so you should be covered there, but you have to make sure that your customer is also doing that. If you're neither the importer or your customer isn't the, in, in, isn't the importer, uh, then you're not subject to dietary supplement GMPs, and so then you must comply with all of the rules of SSVP, um, with the exception of a hazard analysis that is not required. So um, supplier verification activities must provide adequate assurances that your supplier complies with all of the 21 CFR 111 standards. So this was very confusing for a long time, what in FSMA and what in FSBP applies to a dietary supplement company. Um, so the, the FSBP requirements came out in 2015 and it was a lot of confusion for uh, many years, uh, I guess three years. Uh, but then the FDA produced a guidance for industry entitled Small Entity Compliance Guide. Um, these can be very valuable uh, guides that the FDA puts out typically with the new regulation this one is on FSBP um, for importers of foods, and it was issued in January 2018. So it's actually pretty good. Um, so it has a table um, that I've adapted here um, just to simplify it um, that lists out, depending on what kind of importer you are, if you're that direct importer, that self-importer, whether your customer is the importer or whether neither of those things are how they, right? So this table sort of lays that out like we just went through in the slides. Um, so you have to identify yourself always, as, have to identify always who is the importer of entry and you have to have a qualified individual always. So those, those two things are across the board required. Um, you also have to have record keeping requirements in accordance to 1.510. If you're Following 21 CFR 111, which you should be if your customer is the um, importer, you would then be compliant with 21 CFR 111, so your record keeping will cover you there. But then you also need, again, to have that written assurance from your customer that they're compliant with 111 also. And if there's not compliance with 111, then uh, there are many more FSBP requirements that are applicable. So the FDA's mandate um, is to protect public health, right? And so that's how they always look, that's the lens that they are always looking through with everything that they do. They are responsible for the safety and security of our nation's food supply, and that includes dietary supplements. The way that they enforce this is that they will uh, have inspections of dietary supplement facilities. This is both foreign and domestic uh, facilities. And if a dietary supplement does not meet any of those GMP requirements, or if the facility that manufactured the product is not meeting those GMP requirements, regardless of the, whether there's anything technically wrong with the testing of that, that product, the product is considered adulterated. If you're not complying with the labeling requirements or it doesn't meet label claims, then the product is considered misbranded. In the era of COVID-19, um, the FDA has, has been um, very active during this pandemic. They've made quite a few public statements. They issue a variety of guidance documents on many topics. Um, they've communicated various policies. They've informed the public about the status of the product it, it, um, they regulate, and they are providing a daily update of all of those things that they've been doing. So um, my, my inbox is full of all of these different things. 
So some of the things that are relevant to your supplier qualification program for a dietary supplement manufacturer is that they have postponed all routine foreign and domestic inspections. We'll elaborate on that in a minute. Um, they've also provided a guidance for industry on a temporary policy to not enforce all aspects of SSBP while this uh, uh, epidemic is ongoing. They've also assigned food facilities, including dietary supplement facilities, as essential build businesses during this times of, these times of lockdowns, and they provided a number of recommendations to food facilities. So way back on March 10th, which seems like forever ago, <laughs> the FDA postponed foreign inspections through April. That has obviously been extended um, kind of indefinitely at the moment. Um, these inspections, outside, any inspections now outside of the U.S. would only be done if there is a, cons uh, a mission critical. It would obviously be difficult for the FDA to get to some of these sites with the travel restrictions that we have on various countries um, and, and just airline travel in general. Then uh, a little over a week later, um, uh, Dr. Han came out and also um, temporarily postponed all domestic routine surveillance uh, facility inspections. At the same time, it dictated that all FDA employees will begin teleworking like many of us have been doing for a month, month and a half. Um, again, with the domestic inspections, similar to the international inspections, will be done uh, in a meeting I was uh, present with with the FDA they kind of discussed that mission critical would be those cases of class one recalls any sort of foodborne outbreaks that they need to evaluate or anything related specifically to COVID-19. So with the uh, suspension of these foreign inspections the FDA listed a series of alternative tools and methods that they're, they're going to be using in lieu of doing these inspections. Uh, because these are coming in from foreign um, suppliers, these are, they would be able to deny entry of any of these unsafe uh, products. They can physically examine a product and sample things at the border. They will review um, the previous compliant history of the manufacturer or importer. Uh, they can use information from uh, other governments um, and work with them. Uh, they uh, employed this earlier with the COVID-19 break. Uh, outbreak um, with China, in fact. This was again before March 10th. Um, and then they can work with U.S. Customs and Border Protection to target specific products intended for importation. So the FDA does have some ongoing programs about how to um, assess uh, things that are coming in through customs. For domestic uh, inspections, obviously they can't stop something at the border, so they have to use different tools and methods to do that. So what they're basically relying on is doing uh, records evaluations in lieu of an on-site inspection. It was really interesting uh, that the FDA, FDA made some noteworthy comments um, where it said, quote, safety and quality need to be owned by the industry and firms have the primary responsibility to reliably produce quality products. They further went on to say that we must adhere to current good manufacturing practices. Um, procedures manufacturing uh, facilities are maintained in appropriate manner and we have appropriate preventive, preventative controls if you're talking about a food. Um, it also stated, which I thought found very interesting, that they believe that the FDA regulated firms understand and appreciate these responsibilities um, to ensure integrity of the supply chain. In addition to that, um, on March 18th, the FDA, the same day, the FDA put out this guidance for industry, which is temporary policy regarding preventative controls and FSVP food supplier verification on-site audit requirements during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Obviously, if the FDA itself is not doing foreign inspections and not even doing, uh, not even doing domestic inspections, how is a manufacturer supposed to do an FSVP evaluation or go on-site and evaluate a supplier for uh, a supplier qualification program. So it's, it's physically not possible in a lot of situations and certainly not recommended 
uh, even if they're um, domestic um, facilities for social distance, distancing requirements in order to limit the spread of the virus. So the, the, the FDA put out this guidance, which basically says that they are not going to enforce the FSBP requirement for foreign facilities during this time. Despite all this, obviously there have been some supply chain disruptions. Qualified suppliers are the preferred suppliers because obviously now we can rely on the certificate of analysis and go to reduce testing schedule. This uh, eliminates testing costs, or I shouldn't say eliminate, reduces testing costs, and also timelines for the receipt and turnaround time of materials that come in so that you can uh, produce your product. So anything that assesses that uh, those materials from your qualified su preferred suppliers um, can be a headache. So alternative unqualified suppliers would have to be identified and employed at least temporarily during that time. And then depending on how long this disruption goes, um, you may have to consider actually qualifying some of those additional suppliers um, so that you can eventually go to reduce testing schedule rather than doing full testing to the entirety of your raw material specification. So at this time, the development and implementation of a multi-step risk-based supplier qualification is vital more than ever to make sure that you have um, the quality of the raw materials that you need. So with that, um, I'll uh, take any questions that uh, you may have. Who is a qualified individual? So a qualified individual is a process that you actually uh, must go through. So um, on the uh, FISMA side, so that, which is a training um, to make sure that you're following quality requirements, we do have uh, a program to do that at EAS. And there are many other uh, groups that offer that sort of training through the FDA. So that's something that um, I can provide some information for you uh, when we send out a thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you again, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.